shows you how we do screen printing, what our equipment looks like, and if you ever want a tour, we do give tours. Um, we are not shy about that, so you're welcome to contact me and ask for a tour, and we can set one up for you. It doesn't take very long. It's kind of fun. It's kind of cool. Uh, but once we put the screen printing in, that obviously opened us up for more clients, so we, we do things for small businesses, you know, anything from lawn and landscapers who go through a lot of t-shirts because they ruin them, to, you know, Christiana Hospital, like just all sorts of different businesses. It's really kind of interesting and, and kind of fun. Uh, we get to be friends with our, our clients. Um, so, you know, think large quantities, think small quantities. Well, those same people would, of course, then come to us to want to do things, uh, different kinds of promotional products like pens, like when I'm holding pet folios, um, anything that you can put a logo on, things that they might take to a trade show to give out to keep their name top of mind, or, I mean, there's, uh, there's all sorts of, um, you know, form and function and reasoning behind that. But so we started to get into the imprint, imprint products industry. Uh, in which case, it, it's things that we don't necessarily print ourselves, but we handle all the details of it. So we find what it is they're looking for, we give them multiple options, and we kind of drill down together, find the right product for them, make sure that their logo looks just right on that product, give them virtuals, get them samples if they need them, and have the product uh, printed and delivered by, by usually the manufacturer. So Bic Graphic, you've probably heard of Bic, uh, they make great pens. Bic actually prints this, but we handle all the details for them. So. We do things like that. Um, so we can essentially serve all of our clients' needs with, with those components. Um, so our, our clients range from students to the university. Actually, the university is one of our biggest clients. It's probably three or 400 different offices and clients and teams and things like that. Uh, but they, they are our single biggest client. Nonprofits and small and large businesses. Uh, radio stations, bed and breakfasts, you know, you'd be surprised, it's kind of interesting. Actually, we had a biker gang pick up their leather jackets today, <laughs> so you never know what you're going to get, and it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, we have nine, actually ten now, full-time staff, and we have a variable part-time staff that ranges from anywhere between maybe a dozen to 45 in our high, high time. A lot of times um, they're helping customers, but sometimes you don't see them, they're behind the scenes, cutting letters, pressing letters, uh, screen printing, you know, their artists, that kind of thing. Uh, it's typically kind of nuts. We have about two or three weeks out of the year where we're not going crazy. This happens to be one of them, thank goodness. Uh, but usually we're running around, I, it's like we work in a blender. Constantly, there's constantly something going on. And just when you think you have your list of things to do, set, ready to go, you just get drugged through the day at the end of the day at seven o'clock at night, you look at that list and go, wow, haven't touched it. So it's just the way it goes. And I'm sure I'm probably not alone, but because we work um, on a regular schedule of deadlines and they change on a dime. And, you know, I could, um, you know, my most important task might be working on something that's due in three weeks for someone because, you know, there's turnaround time. It takes time for the, the manufacturers to produce and ship things to us. That'll be my focus for the day. And then someone will call and they say, you know, I have a trade show. I'm sorry, I forgot, but I really need 300 of this next week. And all of a sudden, boom, my priority then becomes that. And that can happen a couple times a day. So um, if you ever come in and I look like I, you know, a deer in the head, you, you know, deer in the headlights, or I can't talk to you, please don't, <laughs> don't be offended. Just know that I have a couple of impending deadlines that have just freaked me out. And I mean, it's not not such a freak out that I'm going to be in a little white jacket, but um, I may not be able to to talk to you that day. So if you do come in, know that I do want to talk to you, but you may want to email me first and just see what my take my pulse. 
make sure I'm not crazy at that moment. Um, but anyway, this is an amazing building. I love that the University of Delaware has now sort of become an incubator for entrepreneurship. That is just the coolest thing. It warms my heart. That kind of opportunity just did not exist back in the 80s when I was in school. It didn't exist here or there or anywhere that I'm aware of. Um, this building is amazing. The technology that's available to you in this day and age is amazing. It's, it blows my mind because it just didn't even exist. I kid you not, I did not have a personal computer when I was in school. My roommate was one of the first people on campus to have one because her parents were professors and she had one of the big square Macs and it was, I mean, it was kind of a glorified typewriter in, in a way because it really didn't do that much and it wasn't connected to the internet, it just kind of typed. So um, just know that you have uh, you have so much more available to you than we ever did and you're laughing because you have um, so anyway, I, I thought it would be maybe helpful to talk about some of the things that I wish I had um, known a little bit earlier in my life and in my career. One is you really should never have to go it alone, and I think probably students know that in, again in this day and age, but I wanted to make it a point, don't go it alone, and I'll talk more about this. And no matter what business you're in, you're in the people business. Um, when I first opened, I really wanted a partner. Um, not a financial partner, I actually had that, but I wanted a real partner, someone who understood my business, who really cared about it as much as I did, who cared about every customer that walked in the door like I did, cared about the product quality like I did. It's really hard to get that in your staff. I have great staff, but the owner is the one that lives and breathes and stresses like nobody else, and nobody can understand it like the owner is going to. So I wanted a partner. Um, there's not always enough money to go around to have more than one partner, but I, that, that was my hope and dream. Um, none of us is great at everything, and that's the other reason I wanted a partner, because you really, you really cannot be good at everything, and even if you could, there's just not enough time in the day to do everything effectively and efficiently. There just isn't. So um, you really, as a business owner, or kind of in general, I think, as a general rule, you really need to check your pride at the door when you open a business, because you are going to fail. You're going to fail at all different sorts of things, and you're going to get up and try again, and um, you know, you want to do them all with excellence, but you really can, you really can use some help. So instead of finding a partner, I worked my self-sufficient self to death. I worked 90 hours a week at about 120 miles an hour all the time, all day long, seven days a week. And um, I was young, but I was getting old quick because it was exhausting. And I live 45 minutes away, not to mention. So, um, and I, yes, I have slept in a pile of t-shirts in my office, in case that's going through your mind. Um, there, I, I think there's a fine line between exhilaration and insanity. And I walked it a lot in my earlier days, and I kind of still walk it now. And I kind of enjoy it in a way, but um, it's not really, uh, there are smarter ways to go about it. So um, I did, of course, hire some staff. And I utilized my family some, uh, but I was still very much going it alone. And then I was recruited to be a member of an invitation-only trade organization. And I didn't want to join. I didn't. I really did not want to join. Um, I think I was afraid maybe of outsiders meddling in my business. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, there was a little bit of politics involved. Um, but I finally came to my senses and I joined and it opened my eyes to some possibilities that I don't think I previously realized existed. Um, you know, I, suddenly I was getting ideas that I couldn't implement on my own. There were so many ideas I couldn't implement them all. And you know, you can, you can come up with great ideas, but when you're one mind, you, you know, multiply that, you put another person in the room, two minds. Multiply that by 60 people, you can just imagine the synergy and the ideas that can come about from that. And if I was, in my first five years, um, you know, reinventing the wheel, which I think I probably did some, um, some of that's good because, you know, it makes you, makes you work harder and think outside the box and things like that. But um, you can't implement everything, but you can certainly take ideas from other people and take the ones that you know are gonna work well for your customers and your client base and kind of go from there. Um, I also, you know, I had the ear of other people that understood that did what I did, do what I do still to this day. Um, it gave me an infusion of energy every time I went to a meeting or had a conversation with them that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had otherwise in my exhausted um, workaday life. And um, to this day, it's still a really important part of what we do and, and who I am as a business person. Um, I 
you know, it's funny because my friends that are in that organization to this day will still tease me about not wanting to join. And it didn't take long before I was vice president and president of this organization that I had no interest in in the first, in the first place. Um, and just like anything, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. So it was actually a real joy for me to take the time out of my daily life and put some energy and effort into making that organization better so it could actually serve me and everyone else better as well. So anyway, so I laugh at my resistance. Um, but it was my pride getting in the way, I'm sure of it. And you know, when you're busy, you really do have to think very carefully about where you want to put your time. And I just was afraid I didn't have the time. And that was, that was another factor too, for sure. It taught me the lesson that um, don't be afraid to have other people come alongside of you and help you. Um, and that's, that's really what I'm talking about here. Now, of course, depending on what you do, there may not be an organization out there, particularly a non-competing or organization, which made this one really, really special and, and still does. But do find people, whatever it is you're doing, that do what you do, understand what you do, and um, want to help you. They might live in California, they might live right next door, um, but, but see if you can seek them out and partner with them in some way. It will, it will definitely be of help to you. Because your peers get it, your peers will get it. Uh, but there's plenty of other places to hook into, so you don't need to go it alone, so I'll touch on a few of those. Um, and as I list these, notice the common threads. Don't go it alone, and no matter what business you're in, you're in the people business. So consider, uh, again, this will all depend on what you decide you're going to do, but consider joining a chamber of commerce. It's a fantastic place to meet people who want to network. You can go to lots of places and meet people, and it's very superficial, and they don't really care to network, but they're there for the food, or they're there for you know any number of reasons. But chamber people want to network, and they want to get to know you. There are plenty of places to meet people that don't. Um, and it may not be that you're selling your services to them so much, but we found our web guy through the chamber when we needed to revamp. We found we were do, we did a great video to sh to showcase what we do, so people know that we do these things in house. And um, I sort of, without even really meaning to interview people, I sort of interview people as I met them. You can kind of figure out where your synergy is with people and choose to work with people um, that that you know you're going to work well with. And if you meet a number of people, you will find someone who's going to better suit you. Um, so a chamber's a great place to do that. And then um, if you join a large organization such as that, it's always a good idea to uh, join a smaller group as well so that you can get um, hooked into and know some people a little more intimately so they can refer your service to, services to others and um, then they can introduce you to people that they know and so you know it kind of grows more organically. Also, suppliers can be your allies. It's really important to have a good relationship with your suppliers. Of course, you know they're selling you what what you're going to turn around and resell, but it goes deeper than that. In fact, when I, as I just um, left to come here, I had um, a rep in who was bringing my staff donuts and, and things like that. But um, they will come equipped with recommendations when we bought when we were buying equipment, new equipment. You know, I kind of went to them and I said, "All right, you know, you sell T-shirts to people all over the country. Can I have the names of some of the people I know that have recently gotten equipment?" And um, you know, I'd like to talk to them. Maybe they're just, a, they can just be a resource. They can um, tip you off to trends, maybe that you would not have figured out. They can provide or, you know, talk, talk to other people who might help provide training and things of that sort. If it's a large company, then the reps will work for you. They will help you get better pricing. Um, they might help you find uh, advertising co-op dollars. Uh, they might send you free samples that you might not be able to get. Um, they'll bring you pizza and donuts, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, but one thing that should should go without saying is pay your bills on time, and it doesn't seem like it necessarily connects with that, but it absolutely does. Pay your suppliers on time. It's vital to take care of those that are taking care of you. Um, I have had some very small vendors because you know we work in the Greek market and then we work in the T-shirt market. T-shirt market's a large market, as you can imagine. It's multi-national. Um, Greek is not. It's very very regional, and um, I've had them say, you know oh, when your orders come in, we move them to the front. Because we take care of them, we pay our bills on time, we become their friends, we, uh, we're happy to give them opinions on new product lines they might be considering launching, that kind of thing. I mean, that is gold. That's gold to my customers, it's gold to my store. Uh, if you treat people right, they will do their best to treat you right as well. And then speaking of clients, clients are your lifeblood. They pay your salary, so in many ways they're your boss. Uh, they are there to fill a need or desire of theirs um, and to make their life easier in some way. So that's 
your mission is to fulfill that. But over time, they'll become your friends. And if you're doing it right, they'll become your advocates. Which means you have a ready supply of positive feedback from those that matter on free public relations and marketing. You have a department that you didn't even have to pay to set up. Um, that, there's nothing more effective than, than positive word of mouth advertising. If you're taking care of them, they will tell their friends. Thank goodness for social media. Um, and then your staff, of course. If you have staff, whether it's one or 50, uh, they're your front line. They will understand your business better than almost anyone will. And um, even though they won't be able to identify with the struggles of the business owner itself, they will, um, you know, they're your advocate as well. They will help you, you know, uh, market. They will, you know, help you figure out how to position yourself in the industry, uh, social media, younger people are always better at social media than older people are. Uh, and they'll also be able to fill in the places where you see holes in your natural abilities. IT is not my big thing. If my computer doesn't work, I want to throw it out the window and get a new one. Um, you know, we have people that are, are, are good at that. I have a person that's a web designer that works for me. That's not her own job for me, but that is part of her job. Um, you, you need to free yourself as a business owner. You need to free yourself up from working in the business to work on the business. Um, I give that piece of advice, not that I'm so good at it, but I need to be better at it. And if that's something that you um, find yourself doing, working in the business all the time, and you don't have time to work on the business, there, there's a real imbalance there. A lot of times I'll work in the business during the day and work on the business at night. My husband loves that, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so trying to find a balance is good and your employees will help you do that. Utilize them, don't be afraid to, um, to give them projects and give them direction. Don't forget to give direction, but don't micromanage it because otherwise you might as well be doing it yourself. Uh, so those are the big ones for me. There's a couple other things, you know, I mean there's multiple other things and it depends on what you do, but you can um, obviously count on your accountants, attorneys, investors, bankers um, to do even a little bit more than you've hired them to do. They may uh, be able to offer recommendations, either other people that might be able to help you and come alongside you or they may themselves um, have, there, there might be something they can bring to the table that um, you're not specifically hiring them for, but they might be interested in helping with. Uh, business coaches, I have not actually utilized the service, but I have friends who are business coaches and people have, who have used them, and they, um, they can really be very helpful. Consultants, I have gone this route. They are painfully expensive. Uh, it can be worth it. If you pay an awful lot of money for someone, you better find someone that's doing a good job, and you better listen, because you just paid for it. Um, so I, I, I'm not necessarily recommending it. There are some free services out there that you might want to utilize first, but it can be a way to go. Focus groups, we have, um, we have used student focus groups, which are fantastic. People are blatantly <coughs> honest, and that's what you want and need. Um, and there, you can also bring in a board of advisors. I just joined um, a group of women's presidents that everyone does something different for a living, but we all have similar you know, problems when it comes to business, and so that's a fantastic thing. Uh, any kind of an advisory group that can keep it, you know, close to the vest and not share what you've shared, but can help you out. State and local entities, believe it or not, uh, Delaware is, is actually pretty good at the end of staying in the state. There's um, the retired uh, executives, uh, SCORE is what it's called, they are people that have typically retired and have um, a lot of knowledge and experience and they will help you for free and every each one of them has sort of an area of expertise usually you're matched up with a coach and then if you need help maybe with uh, financial stuff they'll pull someone else in or maybe marketing will pull someone else in so that's fantastic and even um, the state offers grants and things like that you know there's a vast array so don't don't feel um, funny about sniffing it out and talking to people and asking what's out there if you find that you need help. The u university, of course, this university and any place if you're from New York or New Jersey, New Jersey which I know a lot of people are, that, um, that go to school here, there's probably going to be a university close to you. You may at one point need interns. You know, don't, don't hesitate to utilize that resource. Um, and I would say, you know, never, never stop learning. Go to trade shows, attend seminars, join committees, volunteer, ask questions read books, read blogs, join online forums, utilize Facebook and Twitter, connect to people in your industry, surround yourself with people who know more than you. Uh, I, a number of years ago, I had a trade show out on the West Coast, and our executive director 
um, said, hey, you know, it's going to be over New Year's. If anyone wants to go to Seattle over New Year's, you know, I'll, I'll get a little boutique hotel, I'll get your reservation set up. If anyone wants to go, you know, take your spouse, do that, um, and then we'll see you at the meeting. So a couple of us did that, and there was a brand new couple that had just joined our organization, and we, you know, we had not met them yet, but she said, you know, try to hook up with them. So we did. We invited them to dinner, and there were only like probably six of us and then them. And the entire, we were at dinner for probably three hours, the entire time, they never stopped talking about themselves and how wonderful they were and what they had accomplished in their three years of business. I mean, they just never shut up the whole time. And I thought, how stupid, how stupid. They had a hundred or more years of experience sitting right there in front of them. And all they had to do was ask a few questions. And they didn't. And when we got to the meeting, they were astounded to find that I was standing up at the podium because I was president. They didn't know that. I didn't really care if they did or not. But just a couple of questions, and they would have gotten a landslide of information, but they didn't want to hear it. And they're not in the organization anymore, um, and they're struggling, and I'm not going to tell you that's why, but if you don't listen, you're not going to hear don't put yourself in solitary confinement like I did for the first probably five years. Um, live in your community, draw from the community, and uh, you know whatever you do, do it with passion and listen. Um, and then Ben asked if I would talk about web presence and how we compete against other websites. But I want to first take some questions from you, and then I can kind of dive into that because I probably just sort of vomited out a lot of information, and um, there might be something of interest that you want me to touch on. So, anyone? Anyway. Yes. Um, did you ever, do you have um, any specific like, single person that would ever, like, that you would go to for help? Or was it always the groups that you went to? Um, I think within any group, you find people that you connect a little more closely with. Um, when we decided we were going to put in screen printing in house, there were several people in our group that did screen printing, but there were two that I knew did it with excellence. And so I went down to Mississippi to one and spent a week with them. And then I went up to Rhode Island to another and spent a week with them. Um, and it just so happens I've gotten closer to them just because I've spent time with them, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it, I mean, it kind of depends. It kind of depends. I had an accountant for years who was not a very warm and fuzzy person who did his job, and that was kind of it. And when he called, I would like roll my eyes and be like, all right, here we go. You know, it just was, just was no fun. I mean, he did his job, but he never really came alongside me. Um, as a financial advisor, not that that was his job, but you know they they know a lot a lot more about numbers than I will ever know because that's not what I studied. Um, and now I have an accountant who, yeah, she holds me to the fire because I need to get my reports in on time and things like that. But she's right there if I have a question, you know. I, I, so yeah, I mean there are people like that, and then I have certain employees that have you know, really been advocates over the years. I've been very fortunate that many of the people that work for me have been with me for a decade or more. And so they know a lot about the business. Okay. They, you know, they feel like it's kind of theirs. And I, I rely on them and I, I take their opinions to heart. Is that kind of the answer you were looking for? Yeah. At first, when you were starting out, and you said you were working 90 hour weeks, you ever, was there a point where you felt like in your state home or job? I never did, it's not weird. I never did. No, I always thought it would get better, I guess. Um, I, I loved what I did and I love what I do. And um, so now, it's dumb. It's dumb. Looking back, I probably should have. But anyway. Once you've said this, though, what did you study in college? Oh, I didn't say that, I don't think. Uh, communications. Um, I did, once I realized that I was going to do what I'm doing, I took one business class. Which I, you know, again, 2020 hindsight would have been nice if I had taken more. Um, and it was called Problems of Small Business, and it was actually the class to take because it taught, taught me all about the things that could potentially go wrong and all, just all the stuff that you have to slog through. I know a lot of times we think about, oh, this is great, I'm going to solve this need, you know, I have this niche and nobody's doing it and I have the best whatever. And, you know, we think like that as entrepreneurs, that's how we think. But there's a lot of crap that you have to go through on a daily basis and <coughs> even just government stuff. And that's all the stuff that to this day I still kind of hate, but you have to do it, it's necessary. So, anyway, so communications. Is the next one. Um, how long did it take you to turn a profit? 
we actually, believe it or not, we turned a profit in the first year, but it was it was minuscule, and it's because we ran everything on a, a shoestring, and um, there was no one doing Greek at the time, and it was kind of a big, exciting thing. You know, we had very low rent. I mean, all, all the things that kind of go into it. Do we turn a profit every year now? No, we do not. We do not. Um, I have a question regarding location. Yes. So, uh, have you noticed if your <coughs> your target location, target audience, is it shrinking or is it expanding now with you know with technology and that? That's a tricky one. Um, it, to talk about physical location, when we first open, we have not moved. We've grown in our spot. We're, I don't know if you even know where we are, some people do, but we're over there kind of behind the little bob up the street from Trabant. The campus was not very well developed out there then, and so that's why the rent was so cheap when we turned a profit our first year. It was that we were a little bit out in the middle of nowhere, but we were a destination store, and then people would come from other campuses. We had parking, and so it worked for us. Um, the campus has continually grown, so it has made us more visible for things like screen printing and things that the rest of the campus might need for other businesses that are driving by and they see us, that kind of thing. Um, but location, as far as competing in an internet world, which is where, what Ben wants me to talk about, our location is not in our favor. Um, it's great for retail, but retail isn't what it used to be, as you probably know. And, um, we're in, a, you know, we're in an expensive area. We're not in a warehouse in the Midwest. So our prices are, the things that we have to do to keep our, our doors open, it's just a higher, you know, higher investment basically. We have, we have a lot more invested in our infrastructure than someone who just has, you know, a warehouse space somewhere. So from that perspective, it's a detractor. Um, you know, chances are in five years we will move all of our production somewhere else and maybe, maybe have a small retail presence there so people who want to do retail pick up. We do probably more corporate in our retail store now than we actually do walk-in because students will, you know, order online at 2 o'clock in the morning and come pick it up, people from Delaware, which I never anticipated, but it does happen. Um, anyway, so, um, Good and bad. Campus definitely has grown around us, which is nice. Um, but to compete nationally, it's not the best. Yes. Sorry, I got a lot of questions. It's okay. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that um, you had a lot of dedicated employees mm -hmm. that worked for you for a while. Mm -hmm. How how did you get to find those employees as opposed to somebody who's just looking for a paycheck? Yeah, um, they most of them started with me as part-timers when they were in college and liked it enough to stay on and had skill set enough to, um, to stay on and either be a store manager or um, we had one guy that was getting a degree in, in um, you know, IT and, and we, had, we had just gotten a new IT POS system and so we kind of put, that was his project and um, and another girl who started a web company but has recently come back to work full time and do some of our production on web. She kind of like splits her time and artwork and things like that. Another guy was actually working for the university in the art department and they, um, when we got a new president about five, six, seven years ago, I can't remember, but anyway, they started to reorganize things and the lowest man on the totem pole was out. That was him. Went to a happy hour with a really good friend of mine who works in the same office. That guy was there. We were having a beer together, got to talking, and he needed a job. I needed an artist. And it's been there since. So, I mean, and the people that do a good job for me, usually I mine them for other, for other employees because they know how hard it is. It's a really hard job. It's not a normal job. It's not normal retail at all. And um, so they know the ins and outs of it, and they understand what kind of personality is going to fit well. Yes, you have to be friendly, but you have to be friendly and on the ball and be able to do 12 things at once. And you know, it's kind of a little bit different in some places. So that's, that's a great question. Okay, one more. Um, that, what do you what do you plan? Um, like you said that you wanted to um, not spend so much time working in the business as opposed to on the business. Mm -hmm. What do you, um, what do you plan on doing as far as expansion? I I can't say that we will ex 
expand, but you always have to be looking at the numbers and seeing where you're falling short, where you might need to market a little harder, figuring out what segments of the regional um, demographic we might need to be reaching, you know, that kind of thing. I have a girl that works for me and she, she helps me implement some of the marketing and, and Facebook and social media and Instagram and all that stuff. And she said, well, you know, all these corporate clients, they, you know, they probably have, you know, students, you know, their own students that are Greek. And I'm like, yeah, they probably do. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time and energy on that. You know what I mean? Like the percentages there are small. Just, you know, things like that. I mean, I, you know, just things like um, doing budgeting. I mean, it just takes a long time and it's not something I enjoy and I really need to set aside time for that. Um, thinking, you know, you need to have a five-year plan, ten-year plan. I need to consider succession. You know, what I'm going to do if and when I ever retire, you know, I, I don't know if I ever will, I'll probably die there, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I have six stepkids, only one of which is even probably reasonably interested in the business, um, <coughs> I'm only 14, so I mean, you know, I don't know, there's a lot that goes on, should, I carry like about a 40 pound bag of paperwork and, you know, laptop and all that stuff home with me pretty much every night because if I have time to chip away at some of the bigger projects, I kind of sort of consider them bigger projects because you need to set aside time, undivided time, where the phone's not ringing and people aren't expecting your attention to really dive in and think about things. And I have, I have an outside, I have two outside salespeople, one that goes to a lot of chamber events and actually is sort of our face out there in the marketplace because I can't be and we'll develop what she needs to be doing, you know, for a six month plan, the things we need to, um, you know, the tabletop events we might need to go to, you know, what is our marketing gonna look like for that? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, as opposed to writing orders and frantically getting artwork done. And things like that. Um, so Ben asked if I would talk a little bit about um, our, you might have to prep me again, but how we compete against other websites, basically. Um, you know, what, what about our web presence basically gives us an advantage. And about two, well, we, we had a website, gosh, maybe probably early on, maybe 12 years ago or something like that. It was one of the earlier Greek websites, and this is strictly Greek. And it didn't take long before it became sort of old and clunky because, you know, the technology was improving. And we were, it was on an old platform, and no matter how much we did to make it prettier or more efficient, it just, you know, it really needed, we needed to pull the plug on it and start fresh. So we did that about two years ago. And it's, it's up to about 300 pages now, which may not sound like a lot to you, but it's a lot. It's a lot, and we're continually working on it pretty much weekly, actually daily. We have a meeting every Friday, and we, we were talking about some of what needs to happen on it. Um, it used to be that college students, be, now, you know, before the web, and I know it's probably hard for you to even think back that far, but before the web, you know, people would, well, there were catalogs, which we actually still have. There were catalogs, people would shop, they would call orders in. Even before catalogs, we would, would describe plaids over the phone, it was maddening. But um, people would come in from other schools, and we would spend our Friday and Saturday afternoons just helping people from all over the region who had driven in. That doesn't happen anywhere near as much anymore as you can certainly expect. So when people go on, you know, on the World Wide Web and they're looking for Greek stuff, at that point, you sort of become a commodity. There might be a relationship there, but for years we developed a relationship. If we said we were going to ship something on Friday, we shipped it. If we said we were going to ship a green, whatever it was, we shipped it, pink, whatever it was. If something wasn't quite right, we made it right. It was all about the relationship, and people trusted us, and they came to us, and they told their friends about us. When you're out there on the web, you know, it, we get orders from California, from Washington State, from Arizona, from all over the place. And I think to myself, first of all, you have no idea who we are. You're, you know, you just give us your money and you don't know if you're gonna get it. You don't know if you're gonna get it in time. We do do it in time. And actually what's kind of interesting is we can start to see pockets of, you know, areas of the country where we're getting more business because we've sold a shirt and then they've told their friends. And so, you know, word of mouth actually does still work to some degree. But, you know, when it becomes a commodity, Sometimes it's price-based. Sometimes it's um, for us. It, it may be um, what kind of what kind of patterns we have that they're looking for. Lily Pulitzer, maybe, or Chevron, or you know something like that. Uh, they might be looking for American Apparel that maybe someone else isn't offering. Um, 
you know, they might be looking for free shipping. If they order hundred dollars worth, they get free shipping. We do offer some coupons and things, but I think if we're on trend, we offer variety. Our turnaround is solid. You know, we do still have people behind the computer. I mean, every single day we pull physically pull the web um, orders off and we physically touch them and do you know work on them and ship them out. It's not, you know, even Amazon has people. You know. Um, we put a video on there to make sure that people know that we're doing the work in-house. Um, even if you order from like Custom Ink, which is actually very expensive, by the way, they have, they're not printing their own shirts. They may print some of them, but they have printers all over the country that do them. So we're actually doing our own stuff, and we have control over the quality and, and that kind of thing. Um, there is still some organic, um, you know, word of mouth marketing. We do um, incentives, you know, sh share, share, you know, share to win it, you know, just different things like that. Um, we still drive people to our website physically as we're standing there talking to them often, that kind of thing. We stand behind our product and um, we actually stock a lot of stuff and we can turn it a lot quicker than most people can. So, I mean, we, we have a place on our website that you, people can put notes and we'll say, you know what, and we encourage them to do that. If they need it by a certain time, tell us so that we can, you know, put it on there so we can make sure we hit it. So things like that. But that's one of the hardest things for me to combat, and it will probably always be, because we're never going to be in a Midwest warehouse. We will, we sometimes, our screen printing is actually very reasonable, um, but I don't know that we will ever be able to compete against someone with low overhead strictly on price. But there's, you know, they always say, I forget how it goes exactly, but you know, pick, pick two, you can't have price, quality, and service. Um, we're pretty good on, on price, we really are, but you can't beat our service and you can't beat our quality. So, you know, it depends on what people are looking for. You have anything, any words of wisdom for me? I would love to hear it. Or maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I don't know, but I'll take it if you want to. I would love to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one, so. Okay. But any other questions? Just like more of a word of wisdom, like I love the emails with like the cap sales oh, and all of that kind of stuff. Like I think it's really helpful. And I know like, personally there's been times where I've got one of those emails and like that day I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go make a shirt. And I like went and got letters like that I definitely didn't need, but I like sent the email and I wanted it. So good. I love the product. So let me ask you this. I mean I, I get I feel like I get spammed to death by people. I get like two or three hundred emails a day and some of them I have to deal with and some of them are just junk. What's the threshold? Probably different for everyone, but we only send it out. We feel like when we have something really to say. Yeah, I but mean, and I think that's why it's more meaningful because it's not like every day or every week. It's like when it's important, and then it really catches your eye. You don't just automatically delete it. Good to know. Thank you. In in the same vein, I think that the, the whole idea is opt in for the consumer. Yeah, they have to opt in, opt in. to receive your stuff, mm -hmm. and not something that you're going to push. It seems like. Uh, business is going down that, that way, in my opinion, in mm -hmm. terms of electronic communication. You really want to make sure that there's always that unsubscribe at the yes. bottom. You always want to make sure that that if people don't want to hear about you, they, they have the choice to do so. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. When we get the unsubscribe notice at the end of the week, sometimes we're like, boo-boo face, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, I will unsubscribe from people that I feel like are hitting me too much, mm -hmm. or if it's just something that's not quite as relevant. <coughs> So what I need and where I am, and we kind of get that. I mean, people graduate; they don't really want to buy Greek stuff anymore. I get that, so they should. No, just kidding. Um, any anything else? Was this helpful? Yes. Yeah. I would have yeah. one more okay. question about your Instagram strategy or your visual communication strategy, mm -hmm. uh, crowdsource type of deal. So is what what is the, the so you talked about the fact that you had an Instagram account? What do you do with mm -hmm. it? Um, you know, it's funny, I'm much more in tune with what's going on on Facebook because I'm old um, than I am on Instagram, but the girls that are doing that, I think we're all visual human beings and Facebook has changed the way they do things now, so we can see how many eyeballs are seeing our posts and it used to be the pictures got more views because they were of interest and you, you know, I guess they could see how long people would pause on them and then move on to the next thing. Um, they have completely changed that because they, they want you to pay for it now. So anything that we type out, just strictly text, um, has the opportunity to be seen more. And pictures now go to the bottom of their algorithm somehow, um, unless we pay for it. Um, but I think what we sell is a visual product, and so 
we need to be aware of that and what we post needs to be trendy and you know valid. Yeah. <coughs> so, so do you encourage your your clients to post like pictures of them wearing their stuff? That's interesting you should say that. We do that. Um, we have we have two separate Facebook pages. We have corporate and, and college because they're completely different mindsets. And we have done contests where our corporate clients will post something and then whichever one gets the most likes, you know, wearing our stuff, they get a hundred dollar gift card, that kind of thing. We also have done um, share it to win it's that each and we'll do it again soon, so if you happen to be in sorority, pay attention. <laughs> um, the sorority that got the most likes of the picture that we posted with their letters on it, uh, they got a hundred dollar gift card that they could use toward any order that they wanted. And uh, we got sixty nine thousand views. When that happened, we thought, crap, we should have probably used better pictures because we didn't anticipate it being that that big. So um, we're always playing with it. And as Facebook and, and uh, you know all these companies sort of change things a little, we have to sort of change our tune a little bit too. But it's fun. I mean, I, it's a lot more fun to market now than it used to be because it used to be an ad in the review. And that's it. That's expensive. So. Okay. Thank you. Sure.